Okay, sorry about the little break. We were just making sure we had all the technical aspects figured out. Welcome to the 2020 Summer Series. I'm Jack Fallon from Team 5199, the Robot Dolphins from Outer Space, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Throughout this week, the Summer Series will feature top teams from Southern California in a variety of workshops. Topics such as sponsorships, machining, and recruitment will be covered throughout the week. But today, we will be discussing kickoff and the way different teams approach it. We are welcomed by panelists from Team 3309, the Firebots, Team 3476, Code Orange, and Team 5199, the Robot Dolphins from Outer Space. Would you care to introduce yourself, panelists? Uh, hello, I'm Mike Nelson from 3309. I'm Ian Tillman from Team 3476, Code Orange. And I'm Ali Ruji from Team 5199. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to start um, dropping them in the chat. But right now, we're just going to start with a few prepared questions we have. So can you guys each give us a rundown of your typical kickoff day and how you approach it? Uh, at 3309, we usually start off by having breakfast with, um, one second, I apologize for this. Uh, we attend the live kickoff. Uh, we socialize with some of the other teams that we usually like bring over, or like some teams that come to watch like kick off kick off with us. Then we assemble in the classroom, watch the game video a couple couple times, and read the rules together in silence. That way, we can uh, further uh, get familiarized with the rules. And then we usually do like little quizzes to help us. Uh, we review the quiz results of the whole team and then focus on the challenging areas of the rules. And then we'll read it out together, finding out significant uh, things that we may find or errors of question. And then we have a big discussion of what possible actions that we're going to take. And then we form groups to make, um, to, to help us with what we need to do. Uh, we break into groups to uh, identify the robot actions and tasks and necessary to complete. And uh, each group will present their findings and the whole team will discuss. And then we'll, by the end of the day, have a big um, consensus on what we need to do. And then like we'll make it like in a strategies or like alliance-based scoring analysis. We usually have like uh, create like pre-made bots, quote unquote, to like give us like, all right, this did robot did this, this, and this, and then we will be able to uh, say, all right, uh, what should each robot be able to do? How do we strategize with this robot? And then we'll make a demand which prefer list of requirements that will allow the robot alliance to maximize the match score. And then we will we'll identify any of the requirements by the different phases of each game. For 5199, we actually do a lot of similar things as 3309 just said. Uh, for us, at the beginning of the day, we actually split off into two groups. Our team, uh, like president, vice president, and all the new members of the team, like every single new member interested in FRC, goes over to uh, 3309's uh, uh, high school where they hold, host the live kickoff. This is, for us, a really good opportunity to have all the new members um, interact with other FRC teams and kind of get the full experience. As for all our uh, advanced leads and m team members who've been on the team for a couple of years now, they all stay at our uh, own high school where we wait for the kickoff to go live online. There, the whole team watches the video as many times as they need and start going through the game manual bit by bit. And these are all our advanced students, so they're the ones who are able to fully understand the game manual in itself. Once everyone meets back together at our high school, uh, we have food, we, everyone eats, all the parents are there too. So it's an event that includes everyone on our team. And we hope to have like a good momentum going forward into the rest of the season. There we try to include as many people as we can and start having our big strategy meetings going over what our need, demand, and want lists are for the season. And then from there we start, uh, we make every single person on our team read this uh, strategy manual. And from there on, we start uh, thinking about designs we want to do and 
from that first day, even sometimes we start prototyping, depending on what the game is, and looking maybe at past robots and going through pretty much all like the past 10 years of FRC and looking if there's anything we can pull from any of our own robots or any of the other robots we know of. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the rundown of it. Uh, our team is also pretty similar to 3309. We, as, as a whole team, we go and attend the uh, live event kickoff. And then we discuss a little among ourselves in little groups, not like a sign group, just like friends talking to each other. Then we all grab lunch on our way back to our workshop where we read the game manual as a team and we go through every rule that we think might be important, then generate all the specifications for everything we can do in the game all the way down to like, can we drive? And we put everything as a wish preferred demand. And then on an ideal day, we can sometimes even begin like getting our napkin sketches done and maybe even prototyping on our first day. Yeah, so going along with the designing and prototyping, when do you guys start designing and prototyping? And also as kind of a secondary question, I know at Team 5199, we really reference old teams years design and kind of do a lot of research into that. How do previous years designs and robots play into this? Um, here at 3309, we try to avoid designing the robot until most of the students have had a chance to think about the concepts we could use. We also try to avoid introducing ideas from outside the team until at least a few days after kickoff to allow all students to explore uh, crazy and innovative concepts without the cloud of community acceptance, quote unquote. Uh, as a team, 3309's previous year's designs are an indication of our team's abilities and experience. They can be used when evaluating a concept to determine how much risk is involved in developing and incorporating filler ele elements into the robot design. Likewise, all eventually, other teams' design concepts are evalu evaluated and integrated into our prototyping design plans if they are within the capabilities of the team and the risk level is acceptable. Uh, for us, it's more of a natural approach on when we start designing and prototyping. It depends on the season, but most of the time we start at least thinking about our designs and what we are trying to look into from the first and second days. And then from then on, pretty even within the first and second days, we start prototyping, start trying to bring our ideas to life because it makes it way easier for more of the newer members to kind of get a grasp of everything. And even for them, we have uh, different tools to use for prototyping. And additionally, uh, like you said, for previous uh, teams and years, um, our more advanced members, that's what they are kind of in charge of. They go through all the videos, all the game manuals and everything they've released. And if there's like a specific game that uh, we tie parallels to, like for this game, uh, Stronghold, uh, the same ball, same system, we looked a lot of at that game and we saw what we could take from that and what worked and what didn't. And we kind of applied that in what we ended up prototyping in those couple days. Uh, for us, we don't as much um, like split into advanced teams that like the experience and the inexperience, almost every discussion that we have is as a full team. The only time that a um, line is drawn between like people who are, who have been on the team and understand stuff better than the newer students is when we begin our napkin sketching and prototyping groups. Then we have a lead leading a group of newer students helping to make a napkin sketch. And when we start prototyping, it's, how many ideas are there? How clear are the ideas? If there's a lot of ideas that are just coming out, then we sometimes start prototyping really soon when people are confused about how are we going to get this accomplished? And sometimes it takes longer to get to the prototyping stage because we napkin sketch for longer and we bring out more ideas. Thank you. We actually have a question from the chat from Ali. Um, and the question is, what is your stopping point for day one? Uh, so for what we tend to do as a team, it again, it depends on the game. All the three different games I've been a part of have had much different approaches than what we've done as a team. Uh, for this, a lot of times we try to get as much done as we can. Um, we usually go until around like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock p.m. So it's a 12-hour day for the most part for us. Um, but 
a lot of that is also bonding. And we like to end off with having dinner together and kind of being in the community. But where we kind of draw the line as far as like prototyping and design wise is wherever like we kind of are at that point. And then we're like, okay, uh, that's it for today. Just try to think about it over the night. And if you have any other ideas, tomorrow we'll start where we left off. So that's kind of the approach we take. We kind of have a set the time in advance so we don't like put too much burden on the families and like students on that first day. But we kind of do as much as we can because we want to uh, maximize on our kickoff day. Um, at Thursday night, we, uh, we usually go through as much as we can, just like uh, Ollie said, and we usually end at around nine, but it's like, it's more or less like feel free to leave when you feel tired or, you know, like, uh, like leave when you feel like you've worked enough or something like, or along something along those lines. And we always have dinner together, even during the season. When people are there, we just have dinner at around 6, 6.30-ish, and then we get as much done as possible under our uh, demand, which prefer on um, those lines. Uh, like uh, Ali said, it really does depend on the game for us. Um, we go until 9, we work as much as we can. We try to get as many napkin sketches done. That's normally where we are, but like I said, depending on the game, we sometimes go farther, sometimes we don't even get to there. Um, oftentimes, near 9, it's normally only the more experienced students and the more committed students that are staying, so there are some really good discussions that happen later amongst the kids who are really trying to figure out the best ways to do things. Um, thank you. We have another question from the chat from Angel. Um, I guess this is a little shorter question. Um, how do you, how long do you spend on design and prototyping? Well, on our team, the prototyping process never stops. It's always, is there a new design? Prototype it first. And we're prototyping throughout the entire season. Every time there's a new design, it's always prototype made out of wood or scrap metal before we do any kind of CAD to make sure that we know it's going to work. Yeah, like Hayden said, uh, we kind of have the same philosophy when it comes to that. Like this, for this season, we were prototyping like three, three and a half weeks into the season because it was the first uh, shooter game for a lot of us too um, that were on the team. Um, and because of that, we wanted to make sure we got it down exactly right. So we'd rather spend the time on prototyping rather than trying to fix our CAD last minute, fix our robot, and try to make up for what we did in prototype. So in that regards, we spend as much time as we needed to get it perfect for whatever we wanted to accomplish and our goals for the season. Uh, we usually, uh, prototypes usually start by the end of the first week and sometimes carry through to week three and even week four if there's a high uh, challenging action needed for the game, such as like the shooter game that we have. Uh, we spent a lot of time with our climber and shooter that I know of, and we got those down to a T when we were practicing. Um, and we also have another question from the chat. Keep the questions in the chat rolling. We love it. Um, from Stuart Lee, what are your strategies for getting new and first time FRC members involved early in the process? Um, well, at 3309, we usually hold a uh, mock kickoff a few weeks before the actual kickoff to help the students get a familiarity with what we do at kickoff and how we do it. We usually pick a previous game that no one, uh, the students don't know the, the game that we're going to choose. So we choose a game and then we do basically a kickoff for that game. And then it helps the new students and even old ones get get back into the swing of the, of the robotic season and the, uh, and the kickoff. In 50, uh, in what our team also does is we start preparing before kickoff, like Mike said as well. Uh, what we did um, this past year was we had, we split everyone off in groups and we started with these group projects that were designed after uh, robotics, like mechanisms in FRC that have been used. And it kind of put the, all students, no matter how new or uh, advanced they were, in a position where I had to design ideas and kind of start on prototyping, start on catting, and start kind of putting all the pieces that they're going to need to put together uh, 
on kickoff day. And then, like I said, on our kickoff day, what we do is um, in our strategy meeting and our design meetings, we have everyone in the same room. So that also allows them to hear the different ideas and kind of feel more comfortable to speak up and uh, work together to kind of give their ideas on the table, no matter how like like preliminary it is, uh, we kind of accept everything. Because a lot of the times we do end up picking some things that might not be as conventional and those usually do come from the newer members. So on our team, as I mentioned, when we we're talking about the kickoff day, the new kids are involved by the experienced kids like in groups with them and they in small groups and they say like what are your ideas and they encourage the newer kids to say their ideas and in a smaller group it's often easier for them to explain their ideas and just on napkin sketch it and write down what about this and that the experienced kids can help draw out the ideas of the new kids so that everyone is involved. Um, another question from the chat. We have a question from Tara and it is, when do you begin CADing? The CAD comes when the prototypes are done. Um, when we know that we when we know what design we have, that's when the CAD starts. And sometimes that's a little later than we like, but we try to get it around week two ish. So for us, um, it's not a matter of like when CAD, CAD usually starts a uh, week one, like the first three days into it, we start with whatever we can, whether that's the drive base or whether whatever ideas that we have in place. Um, but then when CAD ends is a whole nother story because like we said, we prototype very late in the season. So uh, a lot of those ideas that are developed later on have to be cad before we actually can machine them. So where CAD ends, we usually try to aim for like week three but um, that's usually a luxury that usually doesn't happen. So we just try to get our CAD members as, like on, to, on it as we can um, and try to push to have it as soon as possible. But again, it's a lot, especially for changing ideas late into the season. Um, at Thunder 309, we usually begin CADing uh, start week one with like the robot frame and then we get the drive components and we also use a uh, create a spatial allocation model to reserve space for mechanisms like when we're creating the robot if we have room for like maybe all right let's say we want this we can uh, add add room for that later on if we need to okay um we have another great question from the chat keep the chat questions rolling um, it's from Rick Uva. Second question from Rick. Uh, do you disassemble your past robots? Um, and if not, are they helpful in prototyping? Uh, for us, we actually, we like to make a prototype robot. So we, ba we basically make the entire robot out of wood. And in order to do that, we use past robots drive frames. Um, for the most part, we don't like there's no disassembly day for past robots, but they do get disassembled as we need parts and as we need stuff and frames, they do get disassembled. For our team, kind of the same as Hayden said, um, the past like three years, we've been making uh, practice robots as well. So uh, on top of our competition robot, we have our practice robot. And if we need to like take apart those uh, practice robots, we usually do that whenever we need like oh, we need to test this intake out with something or see if this design works. We usually feel free to take those apart. But for competition robots, like we've been trying to keep them more or less uh, intact so we can like have them to reference like later on if we need to. But um, I know like we've only started doing that the past couple of years. Before that, most of the robots got taken apart for parts and for different pieces. Uh, we usually, not that I know of, we usually don't take apart our product, our, um our past robots, but when we do, we uh, they are very useful for our prototypes and our mechanisms that we might need from past games. I just wanted to add in on our team, the past robots of our like better ones that are still holding together, like are often our competition bots, we do end up using as defense bots at the field to help drive our practice. So just thought of that as they were talking. 
Um, question from Veronica Diaz. I'm assuming she's a programmer. She said, do you do any programming on day one? I am not personally on the programming team, but as far as I know, I think they do have some pre-started programs and like stuff from other years, but for the most part, there's not any like explicit robot program that begins on like right on day one until we have a design ready. Pretty much exactly like what Hayden said for our team as well. <laughs> uh, I also am not personally on the programming team, but I would assume that uh, 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 maybe maybe vision programming from like vision targets, but not not very likely. We'll probably have like basic like things, maybe like uh, driving or something like that. Maybe we do, however, try to get our drive base built as soon as possible so that we can practice driving and practice programming with that. It's not day one, but that is the first thing that is built and pro and programmed. Let's look at the chat. Um, a question from Alessandro. It says, do you guys ever test out robots from previous years off season and try to improve those ideas for possible usage on future designs? I'll, do you guys want me to read it again or did you got it? You mean for like within the season, like for off season competitions or try to like take our 2019 robot and use it for the 2020 game kind of thing? I think they're referring to you improved your robot in the off season, hoping that you're going to use some of those ideas for a future season. We, we never plan for future seasons. Everything that happens is like we built the entire robot from scratch each season. We never, yeah, no. We do like um, Hayden was saying, we do have a lot of our driver like practice done on our last year's robot. So if there is anything that we add to like make it better so they can practice more things, uh, we do do that. But yeah, we don't think in advance because there's too many variables to try to like predict what the game is going to be. People have tried on Chief Delphi for years and can't say any of them have succeeded. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we usually just improve for our off-season competitions. We just take the, the season that we just had mm -hmm. and... Uh, we also use it for, uh, we always save our robots for drive team training and for those new students who might want to try out drive, might want to be at, on the drive team, we would also use those robots as well. Um, we have a question from John Chang. I believe we kind of touched on it or covered most of it already, but he asked, do you guys create profiles for robots, CAD and prototyping on the first days and when does that happen generally? We can cover it up really, really quickly because I think we touched on it earlier. Um, yeah, pretty much. I think most of our teams are on the same page on this one. But um, for prototyping, we start like whenever we're done with like strategy and we're done with the bulk of the kickoff day. So try to bring our ideas to life. And then for CAD, uh, we usually all start our drive bases pretty early on. But then um, everything else kind of has to wait for our design to kind of solidify before we start investing into it. Um, and then we have a comment or prepared question. Um, let's see. Um, how do you guys approach the rules manual and balance it with design on kickoff day? The rules manual is always the first thing that we do. We, you have to understand the game before you can be, begin designing the robot. Like, like on our team, we go over as a team. We read the whole thing. We go through every single point. I know on um, the other teams, they individually go through it. We like to go through as a team so that like we get all the opinions and every like even the new kids can hear the experienced kids' opinions on certain rules and what's important and what's not. Uh, we always go to the rules manual uh, almost as soon as we're done with our kickoff event and we go and they'll, they will drive our demand which prefer requirements as uh, just details and I also kind of touched on it that we go through the rules and then we'll 
do a little quiz to help us understand the rules and we'll be we'll uh go over the ones that have been mainly missed or ones that might have been a little challenging and then will give us a better understanding of the rules and help us with our strategy um on top of what uh, hayden and mike already said we do also um at the end of our going through all the rules we have a portion where we try to pick at the rules and see if anything that other teams won't have noticed like i know in 2018 um a big portion of our design was our climber and we actually were able to climb from the side of the bar because we identified that it was like a square uh, tube um like i know a lot of teams like didn't even notice that so like if anyone like notices something along those lines we always like bring it up in the end um so we keep it like fresh on top of our heads so if we have a chance like we usually get to capitalize on it another really good way to make sure your team knows the rules is that 1678 comes out with a rules quiz each year and you can go through that with your team um i know mike was talking about the rules quiz. i think i don't know if he was talking about that one or if they made their own but 1678 is a really good one each year um we have another question from rick um he said do you do off-season projects like creating a mechanism or program you have never done before to be ready for the season and kind of building off that how do you guys prepare for kickoff? Do you guys do a mock kickoff day or how do you guys really get members ready? Uh, we try to do mock kickoffs. It's not always the most successful because we don't always have everyone, all the new kids like wanting to come, but we do try to organize one each year. Um, we also continue our iterative design. We do like we are testing out Swerve this off season. We are and we're continuing to iterate and try, try new things in every off season on our team. It's a great opportunity in the off-season competition is to try out new things, see what works without the pressure of disqualifying from worlds or whatever. Uh, sometimes uh, we challenge ourselves to create something over the summer or in the fall to like develop a concept, and uh, sometimes we will try to uh, try something that we are not comfortable with in the past and try to improve upon it so that we're more comfortable with it in the future. And like I said before, we do do a mock kickoff where everyone is encouraged to come and it helps everyone uh, remember what we do at kickoff. It helps new students prepare for kickoff and what we do during kickoff. In our first semester, since we're technically like classified as a class two um, in our school district, we do have focus a lot of our time and energy into training uh, different members, especially like those newer to the team on different parts of the team, whether like say it's someone who's interested in programming, uh, we use that portion of our year to kind of train them up and build them up so one season comes around, they're ready. And kind of the test for all of that was the group projects that I was talking about earlier to kind of like apply everything they've learned on like hands-on activities to hopefully like make them, not only make everyone understand what like season's gonna feel like, but to also be prepared, like Hayden said. A lot of the times we might not be that used to using something or a new a certain mechanism so just working on it in the off season can make it like second nature when season comes around and we know we have to do the same thing i can build up that a little more off season is a great learning opportunity for a lot of newer kids that's where we train all of the manufacturing electronics um up and coming cad students often try to redesign parts of the robot and improve them sometimes they actually get put on the robot for competitions and we also have mostly new student pit crews that so they could try it out and see what it's like and see if they want to be on it during the team. So it's a very great opportunity to get newer kids involved in learning about the team. Um, remember, if you guys want to ask any questions, feel free to drop them, drop them in the chat. We will be addressing them. Um, we have another question. When it comes to designing or building field elements, what are the first aspects of the field that you begin building and how do you decide which parts to build first? Uh, we usually select the parts we'll, uh, we'll need to use for prototyping, such as like goals, obstacles, climb components, or like game uh, element interfaces to, for the robot. Uh, sometimes we build a quick representation to support quick uh, prototyping and then build the actual field element later. Uh, any components that have vision targets are a priority so the programming team can get to work on recognizing the actual configuration. 
We plan to build the whole a uh, whole field worth of field elements so we can invite other teams to use our field and promote full scale matches, practice matches for drive team training. Um, I know both Code Orange and Firebots, uh, they have full field, uh, kind of practice field. Uh, we don't really have the space and like, resources to make that. So what we do instead, like they were saying, we always, whatever like goal we have. So this year, uh, we built the tall uh, goal tower structure. Um, we actually built it out of like last year's rocket, if you guys remember, to kind of like use uh, resources that we had lying around. Um, and then we made the color wheel. Uh, as kind of like a mark to shoot from and in case we decided to do it later on and we made the um, human player station where they would we would be able to dump the balls in and out so kind of just stuff that we needed to work with we didn't really we didn't try and we also made um our own like version of the climbing uh station and it was much different than the it wasn't as accurate but it the height and all that uh, allowed us to get the prototyping and testing that we needed done so just even if you don't have the resources to make a whole field, it's so important to have something to go off of because you don't want to go into competition completely blind and be like, oh, shoot, I didn't plan for this pole to be there and have that mess up your whole plan. We actually have two places that we build from. So while our field is at one place, we build a robot somewhere else. So for prototyping, we have to build um, smaller versions of the field elements, kind of like what Ali's team does. Um, I think a really good example of what we do is in 2019, we had one level of the rocket set up and it was just sitting on a dolly all season at the right height. We would just roll it around and test different parts of the robot at just that one height and the, it had the angles right, but it wasn't a full rocket or anything large. It was, but it was easy to work with and it got exactly what we needed done. Um, another question, um, when does your team start setting deadlines for themselves and planning your season schedule? Uh, we usually start setting deadlines uh, around the second week, but sometimes uh, it, de it depends on the, on the game and how much development is up in the air. Uh, prototypes usually start by the uh, end of week one and go on to week three or four if there's a high chance of volume in the game. Uh, but we usually start uh, uh, fabricating building before the prototyping process is over, so we usually have those deadlines by then. Our team decides our full season schedule before the season starts, and then we adjust accordingly. But as far as when do we want things done, it's all decided pre-kickoff. Like we know what schedule we strive for. Uh, that's similar to us. Um, the only thing difference being on the second day, so the day after kickoff. If there's any changes based on the season challenge, uh, that's when we make all the necessary changes for the season schedule. And even if uh, you don't like end up sticking directly to your schedule, it's really good to have as a basis because it like motivates your team members too. A lot of the times, like when you're behind at a certain point, more people are going to be like, "Oh shoot, we, I need to put in the effort. I need to put in the time to help uh, get us to our goal." So uh, if you don't like. Kinda, kind of have a strict uh, season schedule, I highly recommend like making one for your team. Um, this year, I know as part of Team 5199, we started using more conceptual 2D drawings on CAD and different programs to kind of get um, the geometry figured out directly from the first couple of days. Do you guys do anything similar um, and how do you use CAD to develop early sketches and figure out the geometry early? For the most part, we don't, but there's sometimes things like for our climber in 2019, we worked out exactly how long things would need to be. And actually our climber this year too, we figured out how many stages we would need and things like that in CAD because it's just much easier. There's no point in testing with wood when you have numbers. So anything that's strictly number based is something you would do in CAD. Uh, for us, um, the biggest part that we had to kind of two dimensionally like draw it out was our hopper um, to kind of because a lot of geometry went into that with 
where the balls line up um, and the texture of the balls like causing them to like stick to each other. Um, because of that, we had to kind of dimension that very like thoroughly, like change it again by like one inch, like half an inch a lot of the time. So that's where we kind of put in all our numbers and then um, where we built off of later on. Uh, when we do our CAD, we always like have our measurements in. We we always start CADing when our prototyping is done and uh, we're more or less done. And then we will get our measurements done. And if they're off, when we like 3D print them, we uh, will try to go through those again and see what measurements are off and try to uh, go back through those again. Okay, we have five more minutes remaining in the workshop. Um, going on kind of along the same lines, for things that require calculations, um, such as like the trajectory, things with um, the balls, do you guys use math or is it more trial and error? Well, like for this year for the shooter, it was definitely a lot more trial and error because there's a lot of factors like the resistance for something as with the um, makeup of a dodgeball that it doesn't really follow like a nice trajectory that you can just mathematically calculate. However, it is something that you can get with consistency, which allows us to program it. So we kind of have to do some reverse whatever there. So we have to see what happens and then solve it. Yeah, like once you use math to get like a starting point um, to go off of. And then from there on, it's mainly just testing it out, see how much like RPM you need, how much adjustments you need on that, and you go from there. Ah, one second. Uh, we usually, uh, it, we usually get like a, a base, like math, and then it's, uh, it'll get easier as we go along. Uh, but it is, uh, more like trial and error but when we're getting close we uh the math is sometimes done afterwards to see how close we can actually get to our tar our better target okay so we got a few more questions as we wrap up so we're going to do a little rapid fire um so we're only going to take one response for each one um er Hemant asked is there anything you prepare for before kickoff we kind of touched on this earlier but any other comments on that? We kind of prepare like a rundown of what we want to do for our kickoff. So everyone knows what to expect. Um, but other than that, it all depends on what the game manual says. So we can't really prepare too much going into it. Um, another rapid fire question. Um, how do you efficiently run the following days after kickoff, such as to be as productive as possible? Also, how do you engage students in prototyping? We split off into groups similar to the napkin sketches where we have an experienced student lead the prototyping group. And that gets the new kids involved, it gives everyone a task. When you have big group, people get left out. So we have little groups, each person tests one idea, like what about shooting with one wheel? What about shooting with two wheels? What about an over the top intake? Just little things with small groups to test everything. Um, and then another rapid fire question, will your kickoff strategy change this year, given that the 2021 season may be similar to the 2020 season? How will it change? For us, it definitely will um, going into it. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're planning on taking full advantage of our off season and fine tuning issues that we had with our robot that we saw at our first competition. Um, and we're gonna, any changes that we see fit, we're gonna make that before the season. First did say that there's going to be some few uh, changes to the game. So it's not going to be directly the same thing. So um, there will be probably some changes, but overall, our plan is to have a fully working and competitive robot going into season, and then we'll make the necessary changes from there. And then the last question is from John Chang. Are you guys working on the robot right now since we know that 2021 will be similar to next year's? We are continuing to work on designs. We're not literally working on the robot because we can't meet, but we do have a lot of discussions over Slack about new designs and new CAD and what we can improve as soon as we come back.
All right. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Mike, Ollie, and Hayden. We will have to wrap up today's workshop. Special thanks to Team 3309, the Friar Bots, Team 3476, Code Orange, and our own Team 50, Team 5199, the Robot Dolphins from Outer Space. The summer series will continue in five minutes at 545 on the same stream, where Team Spider will host a workshop on building a brand and sponsorships. Highly recommend you tune in. They are insane at building a brand. Otherwise, please check our Instagram at Robot Dolphins for more information about the summer series and the other workshops we will be hosting throughout the week. This has been Jack Fallon from Team 5199. Thank you to our panelists and thank you for tuning in. Hope to see you in five minutes. Okay, that's good.
Um, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. We are Team Spider 1622, and today, for today's workshop, we'll be talking about sponsorships and building a brand. So first off, let's get into speaker introductions. My name is Jenna Cow. I'm currently a senior and the president of Team Spider. I'm going into my fourth year of first robotics and FRC. And last year I was the executive assistant or secretary. And I was also pit presenter for judges and business. Hi, my name is May. I'm a rising senior at Poway High School. I'm the treasurer of Team Spider, and this will be my fourth year in first and FRC. And this past season, I was a chairman's award presenter. Hello, my name is Madeline Wynn. I'm an up and coming junior. I'm the chief products officer slash VP of robot. I'm going into my sixth year in first robotics and my fourth year in FRC. I was the previous vice president of public relations. I was a chairman's award presenter for 2020, and I'm one of the first themes list winner uh, for this year. So first, I want to review some fundraising and ba branding background on Team Spider. Over the past 16 years, Team Spider has won multiple first robotics competition awards for entrepreneurship and imagery. We won the imagery award at Championships Turing Division in 2019, the Canadian Rockies Regional in 2018, and the Utah and Idaho Regional in 2016. We also won the Entrepreneurship Award at the Canadian Rockies Regional in 2019, the Hawaii Regional in 2018, and the San Diego Regional in 2016. We've also hosted the Houston Championship Conference for Sustainable Fundraising in 2019 and was asked again to host for the 2020 season, but it was unfortunately canceled. Our curriculum can be easily accessed, found, and downloaded on our Team Spider website, which has reached over 180 countries. So when building sustainable fundraising and sponsorships, we want to start by asking ourselves questions that will guide an organized plan. Examples of these questions would be why and what are you fundraising for? What are your vision, mission, and goals? Do they align with your fundraising? Have you created a business plan or a fundraising plan? And what are you giving to those that donate? These questions will be key to guiding your whole process and finding your target market and target goals that will help you raise funds for your team. Asking and answering these questions as an entire team will help increase team member involvement and interest. You want to consider your team's dynamic environment and attitude because these discussions will also prompt and broaden fundraising ideas and projects that will be specific to your team. The first and most important question you want to ask yourself and your team would be why and what are you fundraising for? There are different ways to answer this question, but the one that will help build the most sustainable foundation for your team are defining your vision, mission, and goals. Your vision is where and what you see your team working towards in the next few years. Asking your team, what change are you trying to make or overarching goal you are trying to achieve? Your mission is your main plan of action to achieve this vision. So what should your team do to make this vision possible? And your goals will be the stepping stones to complete the vision and mission. How can you break down the mission into more detailed and feasible tasks? Think down top, top down processing. Defining these terms will design a clear path for the team and have everyone on the same page. This is why it will be crucial to make the vision, mission, and goals as concise and coherent as possible. When team members have a clear idea of what they are working towards, they will not just have a simple goal but a clear image of their team's future. So ask yourself and each team member, am I committed? Because it is through the team's own passion, action, willing to take risk and persistence that will progress and bring success to the team. Without members that are inspired to carry out these goals, the team will be stagnant and have difficulty to achieve any of the goals. Many teams have trouble when it comes to fundraising because the team members are more invested in building a robot than raising the funds to build it. This is why it will be important to emphasize and encourage team spirit in all aspects of the team. Full participation and team effort will help the team grow, especially if the team has an accurate aim of what they're moving towards. Remember, a driven and connected team will be key to reaching your goals. 
Team Spider utilizes this strategy and adapts a new vision, mission, and goals every five years. The team leaders, mentors, and coaches all work together to brainstorm the purpose and future plan of action that best fits the team for the new chapter. For example, last year, as we met the end of our previous five-year chapter, we updated our vision, mission, and goals to not only impact our local community, but our global community as well. Our vision was to build a generation of leaders prepared to inspire global change through STEM education. And our mission was to transform our community locally and globally by promoting STEM diversity, especially for the underserved and disadvantaged. A strategy that helped the team focus on a specific vision and mission is pointing out keywords or phrases that your team wants to build upon. Ideas such as STEM diversity and generation of leaders are examples of this. You want your purpose and goals to be attain attainable so you can see the effects and progress that will inspire the team and remind them that it is possible. When deciding for the next chapter, you also want to think about growing your impact and vision. Taking in this type of program will make one's thought of as unobtainable goals obtainable. It's also significant to remember that it's not just the robotics members that make the community but also the families and businesses that support the team. All parts working together make the vision and mission achievable. You want to think bigger than just what your team can do. You want to connect and extend your aims and purpose to other groups and organizations that have or believe in the same vision or mission, because this will lead to a stronger community and stronger impact. A mistake that some teams may make is excluding the team efforts solely to students and or coaches. Parents and families are a large part of a working team because they can encourage students and become supportive mentors. Using these given relationships and building upon them will grow your community and give more opportunities to the team members and the team. Coordinating with businesses also help not just the team or just the business, but the overall community. Now, once the vision, mission, and goals are clear, the team can begin making their business and fundraising plans. A part of your business plan would be your budget, which is your estimate of income or expenditure for the robotic season. The vision, mission, and goals will guide what your priorities will be and how you will be spending your funds. It should be simple, accurate, and transparent because it will tell your sponsors what your needs are. This part of communication will make it easier for partners to provide the funds in the right places that your team needs. Of course, being honest with your data will be vital to building your team's fundraising and grant. It will help build reputation and reliable partnerships. Another guide is to make financial decisions and work decisions, such as team purchases and reimbursements, is a vote system with the first and second, so that it is a team decision and so every member is aware of how the funds are being used. The system is supervised and checked by the coaches, but is mainly student-led to encourage teamwork and student initiative. The graph that you can see here is a simple explanation of the team's budget. This data should include the funds and costs of the entire robotic season, not just the build season or just the robot parts. Another example that helps communicate transparent budgeting would be through a donation tracking log. This example separates the different donation groups and provides the target goals for each group fund. This particular donation tracking log would split the parents, students, and sponsors. And you would be able to see which groups can you would be able to see which groups you can expect to provide more funds or others that you might want to work on. These numbers and data will also change year by year due to new team members and new season situations. Keeping track of this data can also help you find a pattern in your funds and donations, which will come in hand when creating and writing the business and fundraising plans. A template of this donation tracking log can also be available and shared by, the team, by team Spider for all teams. Once a budget has been written up, the team can begin a plan of how funds will be obtained. Sponsors can be found and reached through different forms, such as donations, local fundraising events, legislation, grants, scholarships, and or awards. Donations can be monetar monetary or in kind, like food or machine donations from companies or teams. Local fundraising events that Team Spider does are e-waste, SNAP raise, and discount cards. 
An example of legislation would be Team Spider's coordination with Assemblymember Brian Mainsheim and FTC team inspiration to pass the AB 624 Robotics Club tax credit bill that would give companies incentives to support robotics clubs by encouraging more donors to contribute funding to students' interest in STEM. Teams can also apply for grants, awards, and scholarships that can be found through first and or mentor work relationships. Team Spider takes the time during the pre-built season to run more fundraising events, but still continues to run them nonstop throughout the year. When it comes to successful fundraising, there are three key components to remember. Firstly, you want to build trust with your sponsors so that they'll be willing to give you the funding that you need. Secondly, you'll need to grow the relationship so that it is a long-lasting one. This ensures that you'll be able to depend on the sponsor to support you again in the future. Thirdly, you need to give back once you have developed a relationship. As in any good friendship, both people give to each other so that it is mutually beneficial. By making professional relationships and maintaining them, your team will build up a strong network of sponsors, which greatly increases your chances of fundraising successfully every season. The first two components of successful fundraising depend heavily on transparency. Being transparent, whether it is about your goals, reasons for fundraising, or budget, is vital in building a lasting relationship because it ensures that the relationship starts on a solid foundation of trust. By being clear about your goals and what you need to achieve them, the sponsor will be able to understand exactly what they are helping you towards and how you're using their money. As Jenna mentioned before, there are many ways to be transparent, including through a budget or donation tracking plan. Of course, making something like a budget before you have the money is weird. You don't even know how much money you'll have to work with. That's okay though, just estimate. Even if you end up being off, what you demonstrated to the sponsor is that you tried to plan ahead, thus showing your commitment to yourself and your goals. If the sponsor does decide to help fund your team, they want to see you actually use the money to carry out your goals. Planning ahead is one way to show that you're actively doing all you can to reach your goals. The last component of successful fundraising, giving back, can be achieved by creating a tier donation structure. Below is a picture of Team Spider's tier donation structure. Our structure is organized into six levels, smaller donations, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. Simply put, each level is based on the amount of funding, which results in different methods of representing the sponsor on our robot, uniforms, website, etc. But of course, there are many ways to support your sponsors. For example, you could also help push events that they host on social media. If you would like to see our tier donation structure breakdown, again, it can also be viewed on Team Spider's website. Good marketing is crucial for successful fundraising. Listed here in sequential order are the steps of marketing, and as you can see, fundraising is actually the last step. Marketing starts with entrepreneurship, taking the chance to go out and find sponsors in order to support your team. After deciding to do that, you must create a business plan, which will lay out the team's vision, mission, and goals. How you reach out to potential sponsors will depend on who the sponsors are. So identifying a target market will allow you to then create a marketing plan that'll, att that'll attract the potential sponsors you want. After planning all of your steps out, you'll then put it into action with the actual fundraising itself. On the right, you can see a marketing planning process graphic, which we can use to create a successful marketing plan. Although not shown here, Team Spider has developed its own fundraising curriculum which comprises of two, event, two units. The first unit, titled Entrepreneurship, focuses specifically on all the parts of a business plan. The second unit is titled Fundraising a Community Effort and talks more in depth about the importance of being driven by your goals and the different types of fundraising. If you're interested in using our curriculum, please contact us or Team Spider because we are more than willing to share it with you. Marketing isn't just used for fundraising, though, despite the name. Since Team Spider's vision and mission is to create a generation of STEM educators that will bring STEM to all local and global communities, its target market would be students interested in STEM. 
Defining this group of people makes it easier to design tasks to further educate these students. For example, if you are working with high school students, you would probably want to design a hands-on event with a higher level of rigor as compared to a simpler Lego project for younger elementary school students. Marketing requires entrepreneurship, and to be an entrepreneur, you need to take risks, which can be scary. If things go wrong, you could have just wasted a lot of time, effort, and money. But by conducting a SWOT analysis, you'll be able to take risks safer. Conducting a SWOT analysis requires you to realize the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to your team. On the right of the screen here, you can see a sample SWOT analysis this chart. For example, some strengths could be the motivated students on the team or the facilities that the team has. Opportunities could be the sponsors that you could potentially attract or experienced mentors that you have. But maybe your team also has weak funding and is threatened by a potential loss of student interest. Keeping this in mind will allow you to not only create better plans that reduce error, but also create a contingency plan. The contingency plan is essentially your backup plan for just in case something goes wrong. Before talking about branding, I wanted to leave you with this piece of advice for fundraising. Firstly, fundraising is hard and rightfully so. People like their money and don't part with it easily, especially when they don't get something worth it in return. But don't worry, there are people who will be willing to fund your team. So don't stress too much about the money. Just keep trying and the money will show up. Secondly, fundraising isn't about trying to get enough money to build a fancy robot in order to get a title or award. Fundraising is about finding something that you are passionate about and want to work towards and putting yourself out there to ask for support along the way. Similarly, winning and being successful is about obtaining your goals. So put your goals first, work hard for them, and good things will follow. So branding, when it comes to branding, it's important that your team has a marketing plan. Make sure your market plan is tied to your team vision, mission, and goal. If your team doesn't already have a vision, mission, and goal, we highly <laughs> recommend that you come up with one. The plan should also include target funding goals and make sure it's transparent so everyone on the team is aware of what's happening with the budget, branding, and marketing. It's also important that all members are part of the team branding. Not only should you use the design process on your robot, but also to come up with your marketing plan. When it comes to standards, logos, and trademarks, it's important that they have a unifying thematic visuals that tie them to all aspects of the team. Your team branding should be consistent throughout your entire team and everything your team produces. Ideally, your team should come up with a document that has all of your team's individual branding standards. Some of the things that we put in our branding standards are commonly used fonts, exact hex codes for colors, and what changes you can make to the logo and what you can't change, and even design tips from past imagery leads. Both virtually and in person, from your team's website and social media to documentation, email signatures, handouts, and etc., everything should be consistent. When it comes to communication, it's essential to include your team's branding, especially when it comes to communicating with sponsors, judges, other teams, and at outreach events. It helps your team make it helps your team be more recognizable, familiar, and memorable. Ways our team uses branding and communication are logo designs, business cards, team shirts and uniforms, drive team uniforms, pit design, handouts and brochures, and buttons. Your team's branding will make a big impact on what people's impression of your team are. It's important to look professional and put together. The easiest way to do that is to have a clean team image. With the logo design, it's important to have multiple variations of your team's basic logo. Not only should your logo be able to shrink for smaller things like buttons, but also expand for bigger things like banners. Here you can see all the different variations of our main logo. It's also good to make sure you're using the right variation of your team logo for the right job. For buttons, it should be small and simple, so it's easy to recognize and see. For bigger things like banners, you can use more intricate and busy logos. Also having multiple logos for different aspects of your team. We have our safety logo, which incorporates our main spider logo. For our logo designs, we use the Adobe suit, but more specifically Illustrator and Photoshop. When it came to logo design, we wanted to have clean colors and an easily recognizable design, which is why we went with the colors black and white. It's good to have team colors that complement each other and are easily red on top of each other. Having colors that aren't too bright, but not too subtle. 
We wanted to somewhat include our school colors as well, which are green, gray, white, and black. I also highly recommend that you guys make a monochrome version of your logo for when you need to put your logo on something that only has one color or two colors. Our colors on our logo are also interchangeable, which is nice for when we're printing our logo on papers and other things with a white background. This isn't mandatory, but it's a good thing to keep in mind when coming up with your team's logo. On our logo, you can see we also have many sharp lines and a unique design, so it's easy to remember and recognize. For majority of our team logos, we have our team number because it's another way that people can remember and recognize our branding. Having a logo that's not too complicated, but not too simple is very important. Remember, this logo will be seen on basically everything that has to do with your team. When it comes to business cards, it's important to include coaches and student leadership. So if anyone is interested in speaking with a specific sub team, they know exactly who to contact. It's also important to include team logos, but also keeping the business card clean and easy to read. In the past, we've also had our vision and mission on them. We get new business cards every year to update student leadership. We hand out business cards to basically everyone we want to stay in contact with or to whoever wants to contact us. Also, including your team's website and social media on the business card is a good idea. Majority of our coaches and team leads carry business cards on them. For team shirts, we like to have a thematic design that ties to the year's specific theme. It's important to remember who will be wearing these shirts and who will see them. People should always be able to recognize your team shirts from far away and easily see your team logo. On the back of our shirts, we also include all of our sponsors and the school that we're affiliated with. We like to keep our shirts clean and simple with not too many logos and designs on them. We've also had hoodies and jackets that include our team logo or our team number down the sleeve and the first logo down the other sleeve. On our team polos, we have an embroidered logo, team logo on the heart. We do this so that it has a clean look that's simple and professional. For our chairman's presenters, we actually have them wear formal wear or professional wear. Sometimes we even do seasonal merch. Two years ago, we made team Christmas sweaters for fun. For many of the events we host, like First League of League qualifiers and international events, like the robotics competition we hosted in Paraguay last year, we like to do staff shirts. We've also made shirts for our summer camps and even teams and organizations we're affiliated with, like the Poway High School Engineering Academy. Our team uniforms are worn by our drive team. Every year, we like to come up with theme themed drive suits to make our drive team easily recognizable and unique. Not only are our drive team costumes visually really cool, but we make sure they have tons of pockets to hold everything the drivers may need. Many times, we also have cool Easter eggs on our costumes as well. Last year's uniforms had different names of Star Wars pilots on the sleeve. On our costumes, we also include our safety patch and motto. These costumes are easy to put on and just go over your clothes, so at a moment's notice, the team can change drivers if needed. All of our costumes are DIY and made by hand. Normally, we buy basic drum suits and add vinyl decals and patches with our team logos and numbers. For branding on the robot, many teams like to powder coat their robot parts with their team colors. That's a great way to brand your robot to reflect your team. We like to have plastic panels on our robot with vinyl decals. They're clean looking and have our logos, webs, and sponsors. We use Velcro to attach them to the robot so we can easily take them off if we need to access anything on the inside of our robot. Our robots are easily recognizable from the field from anywhere in the stands. Scouters can easily see which of the robots are ours, and we can take and whenever we take photos, our robot easily stands out. For those who can't access powder coating, having plastic panels with vinyl is a great option that's affordable, and even if you just don't have time during build season, it's a really quick method to brand your robot. For pit design, it's important to have your team logo big and recognizable from a distance. As you can see, our pit is easily recognizable with, from our large logo and webs that are visible from almost every angle. For our pit, we specifically made sure that you can condense it down to just one coat, so it's easy to travel with anywhere. It's lightweight and easy to assemble. Not only that, but you could also transform it into half a pit for outreach events that have a small venue. It's important to it should be ready to, it's important that the pit can function as multiple things. It should be ready to repair the robot at a moment's notice, a place to talk with judges and other teams, and somewhere that can almost act like a home base for the entire team. We made sure that our pit takes minimal space and stores all of our robot totes and tools. Something that we like to make, we also like to make, are handouts, brochures, announcements, and newsletters. 
We like to send these out to our school district, parents, sponsors, and using them for present presenting to judges and handing out in competitions. It's easy. It's an easy way to convey lots of information to many people. It's important to include logos, graphics, and good formatting, so it's easy to read and understand. In the past, we were also able to use these as documentation to look back on previous years. For buttons, we like to have a thematic visual based on the year. The button designs you see on the slides are from 2018 for Power Up. We went with an old-fashioned video game theming. We also have our basic safety and basic logo buttons that we use for between seasons and when we're specifically promoting our safety. It's important to have an easily recognizable button that's clean and simple. We like to have fun with our team's branding. We like to do Alliance Awards, Senior Gifts, Mentor Gifts, and other fun knickknacks to hand out during competition and at outreach events. Some of the fun things we've done before in the past are posters, watches, magnets, awards, name tags, and banners. We also like to give out things to highlight certain aspects of our team. This last year, we made scrunchies, coloring books, stickers, and even challenge coins that were all made to promote our team's safety. Team branding isn't just the things that you hand out, but also how people see your team. We also have a spider mascot and a fire extinguisher costume that you can see at almost all of our competitions in the stands and walking around. And also, they are DIY and made by hand. The most important thing about branding is to have fun with it and keep it consistent through your entire team and everything your team does. Thank you all for tuning in to our workshop on sponsorships and building a brand. We'll now be answering questions that you may have about sponsorships and building a brand. And be sure to contact us on Instagram if you have any extra questions or want any documentation at spider1622. Okay, um, I'm hoping the stream can hear me. I'm gonna have that checked on right now, but we have two questions in the chat right now. As Laura says, how did you know you wanted to be in the team and be in the position you are now? Oh, um, I guess we can all go around. Uh, I did previously first Lego League and first Tech Challenge before going to Poway High School and joining Team Spider. And I've always really enjoyed doing both outreach and mechanical work. Um, so it kind of felt natural for me to end up being the VP of Robot and having a background in PR as well. May, do you want to go? Sure. So I joined robotics freshman year because I thought I I had been in science Olympiad in middle school and just thought that I definitely wanted to go into a career in STEM. So I just joined the robotics team to try it out. And then I discovered that I really liked it. So I stuck with it. And I think I really got into it more as I actually went to the competitions and went through build season because that's when you do a lot more of the hands-on work. And for becoming treasurer, I didn't really give much thought to it. I think it was just a <laughs> position that was open and then I kind of applied for it and got Would well, you enjoy it, May? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, I found, well, I got into robotics because I had a friend in middle school that was doing it and I found it incredibly cool and interesting. So when I went into high school, I joined my freshman year because it was my school's team. And so I first went and tried to go into programming, but the, the groups were full. So they were trying to recruit people into the electrical team. And so I went on to electrical for two years, became the electrical lead the second year. And I found that I also wanted to know more of the business side of the team. And so last year I was the secretary of the team and learned more about all aspects of the team. And I found that I enjoyed learning about business and then also about the robot. And I also wanted to lead our team to our vision and mission. And so I applied for president and that is what I am now. That's my president. <laughs> 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 okay, so we have V. Joe. He asks, my team is a rookie team that has to compete with three other teams within a single small city. How can I differentiate my team from others? I think the biggest thing is having unique factors about uh, your team. So as Team Spider, something that we're kind of really known for is our safety program and also our chairman's program. Um, and that's something that we tend to excel at. And once we kind of got an understanding of what we were good at, we kind of pursued that. At first, we never really implied or tried to be a safety team. We just kind of ended up winning the award and we found, hey, 
it's, it's something we're kind of good at. Let's do it, you guys. And I think ever since our, uh, I think it was the first year we ever, or like the second year we ever competed, we won the safety award. Ever since then, we've been working at safety. And I think we're at 23 safety awards now. So definitely having unique factors to your team that kind of differentiates you from other teams around in your area. I agree with Madeline. And it also goes back to the idea of the vision, mission, and goals. Because once you find out, oh, this is what my team is good at and this is what we want to focus on, once you have a, cu a clear goal of what you want to do, it kind of puts yourself out there and it makes it really easy to emphasize different things and become known for, for different topics. Yeah, adding on to what Madeline said, um, I think... For a rookie team, if you want to focus on chairmans, it might not be something you could do right away, but you can prepare for it by hosting events like outreach events and just starting to prepare your documentation so that you can build up like your chairman's resume. Yeah, it definitely takes time. But like we said earlier, having a vision, mission and goal, basically just having a clear goal in your head of what you want to achieve really helps you along the way and not only shooting for certain awards. Because it's really important to dip your feet in basically everything that FRC has to offer. Because you never know what your team may be good at. I also think it's really important. No, go ahead, go ahead, my bad. <laughs> yeah, I also think it's really important to show the passion that you have in robotics because judges, when you're talking to them and when you're talking to other people, when you see that this is something they're really into, it's really inspiring and in that you can tell those are the people that are really into it. Kenny Lee says, how is your team organized, specifically the positions related to maintaining sponsorship, creating the budget, and graphics, etc." So actually, we recently updated our leadership, um, the way we do our leadership. Um, so the way that we do it is we have our main president that mainly works with you know coaches and mentors and works as a form of communication between the student body and the mentors. And underneath the president, we have uh, three VPs, VP of robot, VP of business and VP of PR. And Jenna, can you want to explain more about that? Yeah, so obviously each of the different VPs take on different sections. And so the budgeting and sponsorships mainly go under business because that's where also we handle entrepreneurship. And that is also where the treasurer will be. And maybe did you want to explain more of like how that worked? Uh, sure. So um, as treasurer, like I mainly do reimbursements and purchase orders, but then also underneath the business sub team, we have the spirit and imagery team and they work on like the logo design and Team Spider's branding. So that kind of all goes under business because we have like the financial affairs and the team spirit, spirit wear like all on that side. I think the biggest thing is the VP of business is in charge of delegating the certain tasks that have to do with uh, sponsorships and budget and graphics to the certain leads. And after that, the business, the VP of business communicates very much with the president. And that's how everyone kind of has an understanding. And that's how we communicate among the team to make sure everyone is aware of what's happening. It's also to know that to know that we work closely with coaches and coaches and the parents that help communicate and then connect with different businesses and make relationships do that. Okay, uh, we have Don asking, okay, yeah, ask what do you mean by the money will show up, the money will show up, also fundraising was very expensive. So uh, we actually get that a lot. Uh, we actually get that a lot. And we'll realize, realize yeah. when it comes well, to our team. I have a bit of mic feedback. Uh, if you aren't talking, could you please talk to me? Thank you. Okay. Is it, is it, right, is now? it, is it right now? Uh, no, we still have no feedback. Uh, okay. How about now? That's better. Okay. So when it comes, oh, actually, we get it a lot. That a lot of people think our team is expensive. But realistically, only around 30% of our budget comes from sponsorships. During the entire off season and even during the build season, we're consistently fundraising to be able to, I guess, fund all of our uh, expeditions and adventures in our season. Um, so it's just a really long process. Like even now during quarantine, we're constantly fundraising and looking for more ways to fundraise and even help other teams fundraise. Um, and when when they say the money will show up, I think part of it is since we're consistently always fundraising, we kind of have a consistent, I guess, uh, what's the word, flow of 
funding um, since we're always putting so much work into it. And that's part of it, having people, some people work on fundraising, some people work on the robot. It's just delegating tasks to different people on the team to make sure that everything's working and functioning. I think also like the key to that phrase is to remember that not to stress too much about it, it's working towards the goals. And as long as you're determined and you keep trying, it will, it will work out. And I think when also just having the, the saying, you know, the money will come, that doesn't mean go out and spend as much money as possible. You should still be aware of, you know, budgeting and trying to be as cost efficient as possible. So just to keep that clear, so. Okay, I think we have two more questions. Uh, we have Angel asking, what types of businesses do you target when looking for sponsors? Basically, any any company, anyone um, who's interested in robotics and interested in supporting STEM in our community. Um, we've had a wide variety of different business, businesses sponsoring us, some in government, some locally, some globally, some really big companies. Um, so realistically, anyone who's willing, but specifically, I would say we target companies that have to do with STEM and who have maybe in the past, I guess, uh, dipped their feet in robotics and first. Okay, and I think our last question, unless we get any more in the next couple seconds, is from Daniela. She asks, what are some key aspects that should be included in the fundraising plan? So if uh, definitely your team's vision, mission, and goals, that's super important. <laughs> yeah. Um also, as I said before, make sure you identify your target market because you want to be able to know who you're trying to market to because everyone is different. So you'll want to approach that marketing differently. And then also make sure you have your backup plan, the contingency plan, because things can go wrong and you want to make sure you're prepared for that. And I think that's some that's the main like basically when it sorry Jenna you want to go yeah um, also you want to include visual aids because those are very helpful and easy to understand things like the donation tracking log or maybe gra um, graphs for budgets will make it really easy for um, other partners to understand and I think um, when it comes to your fundraising plan and business plan, just the biggest thing is being super transparent with exactly how you're spending your money. Because um, the thing that businesses want to see the most when they donate or when they give grants to your team is, how is this team using the funds that we're giving them and how are they being successful with these funds? Because they don't want to fund your team for no reason, right? So I guess the biggest thing is just making sure that they have an understanding of where the funds are going and how it's actually helping your team. Because if they see your team, you know, doing successful and doing well with the funds that they give you, it's a probably a good chance that they're going to fund you again for oncoming years. Okay, our last question, we got a new one in, is from Dr. Tracy Nguyen. Uh, she says, what's your favorite thing on Team Spider? And she also said, way to go earlier in the chat. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, I think my favorite part about Team Spider is would be during the build season because although it's super chaotic and everyone's stressed, um, it's really fun. Like we spend a lot of hours together. You get to know everyone very, very well, but everyone becomes like a really big family and it's just fun to spend time with them. And then you go off to competitions and then you get to like see your hard work, like play out on the field. And it's just like, I think that that's my favorite part, Team Spider. Um, for me, I would say at first it was the competition season when you're in the pits, when you're talking to judges, when you're working on the robot, that adrenaline and rush just keeps you going and just ready for the next build season. But uh, now I would say one of my favorite parts is the opportunities it gives, like with public speaking, with reaching out to others, with learning different ways to do business and how to share like the message of first. I think those opportunities that you were, oh, I was scared to take at first is just one, one of my favorite parts. So um, just like Jenna said, the opportunities are incredible. And as much as I love building the robot, I think the coolest thing that Team Spider does is the work that we do to spread STEM in our community and even globally. Uh, I had the opportunity last Thanksgiving to be able to travel to Paraguay with Team Spider and we were able to host the first ever first competition in Southern America, which is incredible. So just like the opportunities that the team gives you, um, 
Also, competition's kind of fun. Uh, well, we actually got one more question, uh, and I know I said that the last couple times, but this will be our last one because we're just about at our time. Uh, Dana says, how do you let your sponsors know what the resources are being used for? Do you want me to answer that? I Sure. Okay. So, um, so as some of you may know, that the bomb was recently, I, the bill of materials was recently removed uh, from uh, something mandatory that you have to turn in. So, even with the bill of materials removed, we want to continue to document every single thing that we spend money on, making sure that everyone on the team is aware of what we're spending money on, and then tracking exactly what money is being spent on what, so that our sponsors are, are aware of, hey, we're buying this with your money that you give us, or this is helping us go travel and compete at here. So the biggest thing is document what you're spending and making sure you have charts and everything just to keep track of the money that you have. Because one thing you definitely don't want to do is spend more money than you have. Probably a bad idea. Um, so just I document think also, everything. I think also communicating um, how what, what your team has been successful in and how their funds have been helpful like because of these funds, we've been able to travel, we've been able to enter these competitions. Those things will be helpful in communicating and building the relationship. Mm -hmm. And something that we also do are press releases, which is what we release um, basically after any big event that happens. So it's pretty similar to what I was talking about earlier with newsletters and stuff. We It has tons of information that like exactly what the team's doing, what we're spending, what we're competing in, what the awards we've won. And we send it out to our district, parents, sponsors, basically everything. We're like an open book, basically. <laughs> and then going off of that, when uh, Madeline was talking about documenting like all the money you've spent on past years, for rookie teams, I would recommend talking to other more experienced teams to get an idea of how much you might spend. And I think it's all about um, what I said earlier about planning ahead and like trying to think of what you'll spend money on because although you're not there yet, you can still kind of like think about it and get a good idea of how much you're going to spend or like what you're going to need to spend money on. And that kind of shows the sponsor like, oh, I'm committed to this. I'm like actively thinking about it and that I'm not like sitting back and waiting for it to like come to me. I'm like taking advantage and making the first step. And especially when it comes to review teams, like start documenting ASAP, like as soon as you can. Because something that we wish that we kind of did was start documenting from our rookie year. We've been documenting it for a while, but it's kind of hard to get stuff from super, super long ago. Um, so that's super important. Take lots and lots of pictures at exactly. <laughs> yeah, pictures of everything you can go to. <laughs> and then another thing with our sponsors is when we do approach sponsors, we give them multiple options than just giving us grants and sponsoring us. We tell them, hey, you know, if maybe if you don't want to give us money, here are some materials that you could help us. Uh, forward and buy or here are some discounts you can give us to help just support the team in general. So we tend to give them multiple options to sponsor a team, not just monetary value. Well, thank you very much, Team Spider. We were so happy to have you guys give our first great presentation of the summer series. Uh, everyone, yeah, someone can join us tomorrow. Uh, everyone, are you oh, I think we have some more of that going on again, if you guys wouldn't mind meeting real quick. Yeah, and if there are any more questions, feel free to contact us on our Instagram account, and there should be a contact uh, through our website as well. And everyone on the stream, thank you for your questions, and you guys can join us tomorrow uh, for a strategy panel uh, by Team 5199. They're going to be explaining their scouting process and strategy for team choices and match play. Uh, you can join us for our second session at 545 for machining. Uh, where teams 3476 and 5199 will be learning to incorporate and effectively use CNC milling and routing in your build. And lastly, our only third workshop um, of the series. Uh, in session three, we'll have fasteners at 630 uh, with team 3309. You can learn the basics of fasteners and how they are used in FRC. Thank you guys very much, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Bye.